so welcome everyone and thank you for attending today's uh, webinar hosted by Legal Aid Alberta, which is Family Violence, How Legal Aid Alberta Can Help You Take Steps to Stay Safe. My name is Wyatt Fraser and I'm Legal Aid Alberta's engagement facilitator. I'll be helping make sure everything runs smoothly today. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to speak to a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, so while your microphone and camera are disabled by default, you can use the meetings QA feature to engage with us and ask questions. With a large number of attendees today, we are asking folks to use the QA feature instead of just the meetings chat, because it'll make it easier for us to track questions and make sure we get to your question. We are moderating the question, so it does take a few moments from when you enter your question for it to appear. To access the feature, you can look at the top menu in Teams, and you'll notice there's a little icon that says Q&A. If you click that, you'll then have a pop-up on the right side of your screen if you're using either your desktop or laptop to join. And from there, there'll be a button that you can click that says Ask Question and then you're able to type your question in there. There's a little checkbox underneath where you can indicate if you want your question to be anonymous. Uh, just for reference, under Teams, you are also to able to look under the More button if you want to mute the notifications. So if potentially, you know, you don't want all the constant pinging that occurs during meetings when people type in the chat, you can also go to More, Mute Notifications, and then that way you're able to focus on our speaker's presentation today instead of the pop-up pings that you might be bombarded with. Uh, so we will have a dedicated period for questions at the end of today's formal presentation. If we weren't able to answer all questions, we'll take them away and then we'll include answers to them when we post the recording of this training on our main website. We'll also provide a link to a survey at the end of today's presentation. Please make sure to take a few moments to fill it out so we can find out how we did and how we can improve public presentations such as this one going forward. We'll also be emailing all attendees a list of some resources for people facing family violence. We respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on the ancestral and traditional territories of many peoples presently subject to treaties 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Gainai, the Pekini, the Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, the Sutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. In an act of reconciliation and gratitude, we acknowledge all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. Legal Aid Alberta is working hard to improve access to justice for people in every corner of our province. At Legal Aid Alberta, we have staff lawyers and a network of about 1,200 roster lawyers and private practices across the province who take on Legal Aid Alberta cases. We focus on youth and adult criminal law, child welfare, family law, and immigration law. As a reminder, today's session is intended to provide general education and is not intended to provide specific legal advice. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presenter for today. Kristen McFadden is a staff lawyer with Legal Aid Alberta and is a member of our Emergency Protection Order Program team. And so, Krista, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, it's Krista McFadden. I'm working with Legal Aid Alberta. Um, I'm with the EPOP program of Legal Aid Emergency Protection Order Program. And so I bring this presentation to you. I've heard from all corners of Alberta this afternoon uh, to speak to the Legal Aid Alberta program and EPO specifically. Uh, just a bit of background from uh, about me. I'm fairly new to legal aid. Um, I've been practicing in law um, in the areas of chi child welfare and family law um, and have joined the EPOP program uh, fairly recently with legal aid, about six months. I'm Métis. I'm from Edmonton. My family is mostly from uh, just west of Edmonton um, in the uh, Stony Plain, Duffield, um, Wabman, Lac St. Anne area. Um, so I'm happy to bring the perspective also of um, uh, my perspective as an Indigenous person practicing in this area of law. We'll be talking about uh, family violence and how, how prevalent family violence is today, specifically about emergency protection orders and what they can do, how to get them, um, uh, and some legal definitions behind the EPO uh, orders that are made in courts. Um, some uh, questions that we'll answer, I hope, on how to apply for an EPO, and we'll leave time for questions uh, at the end. May not get to every one of the questions, so Wyatt suggested that if there are outstanding questions, we'll be happy to follow up after the presentation. 
So to talk about how big the problem of domestic violence is, um, uh, the stats are um, uh, from 2019. Um, those stats are maybe can be taken with a bit of a grain of salt in that we know that much of family violence is not reported. So there's information that is silent or hidden from um, the stats, but what we do know um, that more than a quarter of the violence that was reported in 2019, or sorry, violent crime resulted from family violence. So family violence is the perpetrator to um, an escalation um, of, of crime. Um, Alberta sort of has the dubious um, um, recognition of having the third highest number of police reported family violence victims. Um, so the numbers are high. And again, we know that much of the family violence is not reported to the police. Not only are the numbers high, but they're also increasing. So the um, applications for EPOs since 2018 has gone up about just a little less than 20%. Uh, there was just over 2,000 applications in 2021 and 22. Um, the types of family violence that we know of is that about 94% of the um, um, oh, I'm sorry, about 43% of Albertans um, experience sexual violence. Um, and again, here's the stats again, just so uh, vast majority of sexual assault survivors don't report. We also know that during COVID, when a lot of families and individuals were isolated, it was hard to reach out to community supports and hard to uh, receive the supports available to protect um, um, households. Uh, the restrictions has caused people to feel more isolated, not reach out, and, and the households themselves become a little more insular. Um, so we know that there was more family violence that occurred during COVID-19. Um, and again, the applications for legal aid um, have skyrocketed. So what can an emergency protection order do for the individual who receives one? Um, a protection order is an order granted from the court. Um, and there are specific terms of an order that a court can make on recommendation or on input from both the uh, claimant and later um, the respondent to stop the respondent from going near or entering a specific place. So often what we see in the terms is that the respondent can't attend the home um, or be within a certain number of meters, for example, of the home. Um, or uh, there's usually a restriction on attending the person themselves, so cannot attend, for example, or be closer than 100 meters of the applicant. Uh, it can stop the respondent from communicating directly or indirectly, so speaking directly, emailing, texting, phoning with the claimant and other persons directly or indirectly. The other persons that we often see as part of the terms are the children um, or the child of the claimant, so children can also be included in the protection order. Um, Protection orders can also have a term that allow the claimant to have exclusive occupation. So that means they can be the only ones to live in the home, that the respondent must leave the home. And once the order is served on the respondent, they could there could be police assistance to remove the respondent from the home. Uh, it does direct a peace officer, police or RCMP, to accompany usually the respondent to the residence to remove personal belongings. So quite often what we see when an emergency protection order is granted is that the respondent has to leave the family home. Uh, claimants and respondents do not have to live together to make an application, but this is just often what we see is there are often cohabiting uh, claimants and respondents and the EPO order provides 
prevents the usually the respondent from living at the home. So there can be police assistance for that person to come back to retrieve essential items. This is not a proper process for dividing matrimonial properties. So things like couches or um, things that aren't essential, that's for another day. Uh, but this is essential. So medication, emergency clothing, things needed for work, that sort of thing. The police uh, or RCMP can assist to uh, seize um, and store weapons that might be uh, in the property or on the possession of the respondent. And there can be any, well, reasonably any other term uh, that a judge or justice of the peace finds appropriate for a protection order. So there, there is a legal test. So what does the court need to be satisfied in order to make the order of a protection order? Or in other words, what does an applicant have to say to the court to convince them that they do meet the legal test? So the legal test, the, um, the legislation is under, it's called the Protection of Family Violence Act. This legislation outlines the things that the court must be satisfied that the claimant should be prepared um, and will have support and assistance to say to the court so that a, an order is granted. So the first test is that the claimant and the respondent must be family members. If the claimant and respondent are not family members, uh, members, there are other orders, there's other legislation that does protect them. And the specific focus today is on the uh, emergency protection order. So again, criteria one, that they're family members. Two, that family violence has occurred. That three, that family violence will likely continue if the order isn't made. And the, an important aspect is, um, and this speaks to the emergency aspect of an EPO, emergency protection order, is that there is a seriousness or an urgency for immediate protection to the claimant. So we'll break that down a little bit um, because, of course, there's nuances in each of these um, main areas or main uh, legal tests. So what is family? Um, family members um, have been or are married to each other. A common law uh, relationship, of course, is included or have resided together in an intimate relationship. So if sometimes there's a shorter relationship or sometimes uh, partners have only lived together for a very short time, um, but if they have resided together in an intimate relationship, then that counts as family members. Parents of children, um, uh, that of course is uh, um, family members related um, in blood or by marriage or through adoption, uh, again, the children um, or persons who reside together or one has the care and control um, over the other pursuit, uh, pursuant to a court order uh, that also satisfies the test of being family members. So what is violence? Um, uh, it's, it's quite a broad definition. It is a legal definition. It is defined in the act. Um, so quite often we uh, support applicants to articulate the type of violence that fits within these types of definitions. Um, so intentional or reckless acts causing injury or harm, um, that's family violence. Um, so an accident, if we look at an accident, we kind of look behind, well, what caused the accident? If, if it was really um, no intent behind it, then that wouldn't qualify. But if it was a recklessness that that person should have known that injury was possible, then that includes um, intentional or reckless act that causes injury or harms a family member. Um, it could be damaging property, so wrecking the home, punching wall, holes in the wall, for example, smashing items, smashing phones, um, intentional or reckless, should have known that property would have been damaged, that's family violence. An act or threat that act intimidates a family member, it creates a reasonable fear of injury or property damage, it doesn't necessarily have to injure, but the person has to have a reasonable reasonable fear that injury or damage would occur. Forced confinement, um, the respondent wouldn't allow the claimant to leave the home, for example, uh, wouldn't allow the person to um, 
uh, leave a particular room, for example. And of course, sexual abuse is, is very prevalent. Stalking, attending the home, attending the workplace, attending friends' home, uh, surveillance of the claimant, um, that's stalking, coercive control, um, controlling bank accounts, making decisions, restricting relationships or who the claimant can talk to. Those are examples of co coercive control. And what is an emergency? So um, another way of thinking um, whether um, a protection order is needed for the safety of the claimant is whether the claimant feels that if there wasn't an order made that the acts of family family violence would likely continue in a serious in a serious and reasonable um, there's a reasonable fear that it would continue. So we'll walk through the process. There's several stages of both um, uh, applying for emergency protection order and seeing it through uh, till the order is, is made. So the first step in the process, a sort of multifaceted process, is the application. And we'll break that down in the next slide. So this just covers the two um, sort of main or largest, I should say, centers for applying for an application. The Calgary phone number and the Edmonton phone number are there. Um, of course, if there is a threat of immediate family violence, the claimant needs to phone 911. Um, uh, that, that's a primary um, it's it's information all claimants should hear that if they're in danger that that's the where they should be contacting for their personal safety. These phone numbers um, provide it, it's sort of a one stop shop uh, for a claimant to maybe they just need a referral, um, maybe they just need an ear to hear um, uh, this this is happening to me. Is this the procedure that is appropriate in in my case? There is is a designated worker who answers the phone that has referral information and has information on the next uh, steps to take if an emergency protection order seems appropriate. Uh, the next step is that um, through Legal Aid Alberta, the claimant will have support in the hearing. Often the hearing is ex parte, which means that the other party, the respondent, is not in attendance. It's made just with the claimant making the application. Um, it's one of the uh, few areas of law that an order can be made without the um, without the respondent being present. Um, that uh, hearing is usually presided over by a, uh, a judge or a justice of the peace. Um, and and um, a justice of the peace is available uh, regardless of where the person is in Alberta. Those can be telephone applications. Now service, we talked about the respondent might not be present, might not know that the application is being made and might not know that an order has been made. And of course they have to know, um, the police has to know uh, or the RCMP has to know if an order is made so that they can enforce it. Uh, the respondent has to know um, so that they, they can comply. They're not breaching the terms of an order that was made. So this is called service. It's a formal legal term in, in uh, the legalese world because it means um, making sure that the person is aware of the application that was made the, before the court or the resulting order that, um, that the the court made. So service usually in a protection order context is done by the police or RCMP. They will contact and locate the respondent and hand that application to the respondent. They're responsible, the person who serves is responsible for drafting an affidavit of service. That's provided usually to the, when all things work well, to the court record to say, yes, we do have a record of um, the respondent receiving the 
um, the protection order. So that respondent A should know that an order was made, an application was made. First of all, uh, there was a resulting order and now they have terms that they must comply with. And that leads us to the fourth step, the review. So this is an opportunity for the respondent to attend court and speak to the application. So this is a, a process that the claimants, all claimants have the assistance of the EPOP program of Legal Aid Alberta for this review. Um, it's clearly stated in the order that the respondent should receive that there is a review that they must attend and speak to the application. Uh, this is, it can be done remotely, it can be done in person, it's usually 10 days or so after the order is made and again it's an opportunity for the respondent to attend uh, and speak to the application to say they agree, they disagree or there are some things that they could agree with um, if there were just some tweaks to the terms, for example. So the review is a court process that both the claimant and the respondent are uh, required to be at. Here's the number again, if, if there is somebody who wants to make an application for a protection order, these are the numbers to, um, or the supports to access to make that application. Now I should say it, it is possible for another party such as the police or RCMP to make that application on behalf of a claimant. That's possible. We do see that. Usually what we see is that it is important for the claimant to appear uh, in person, them, you know, either remotely or in person in court, but for them to appear for the review to speak to the application. So again, they have the support of the EPOP program of of legal aid, but if a third party such as a police officer or uh, RCMP makes that application on behalf of a claimant, the review is uh, the step for that claimant to uh, speak to it. So here, here's a little bit more detail about the EPOP, the Emergency Protection P Program out of Legal Aid. There's, there are different things that we do in the program. So the intake information line, that, those are the phone numbers just presented on the last slide. So there's a full-time intake coordinator that can answer the calls, um, answer any questions that they might have. If the claimant is in crisis, they would make immediately immediate referrals um, and they provide information about services um, that are available and the process available for, for attaining a protection order. Now the duty council can uh, provide legal advice, they run the application, so they would do the questioning of the claimant to try to get all of that information that the claimant um, needs to share with the court in order to answer the questions that the court has about whether family violence is, has occurred and whether an order is appropriate. So they um, will ask the claimant questions and try to lead and steer the claimant to speak to the record to speak to the court about their experiences of family violence so that the legal test can be made on behalf from the perspective of the court and the order can be made. And then the EPOP program also runs those review hearings. Um, uh, calling a review a hearing is not, um, it's not a hearing in terms of the review. Uh, usually evidence or information about the order is not debated in a review. Um, usually it's it's to give a, the respondent an opportunity to speak to the application and to decide next steps. Would, it, would a hearing be appropriate on the protection order? Should it be confirmed? Uh, is it agreeable for the protection order to continue uh, for an extended period of time? Um, but there are also hearings in which uh, if the respondent doesn't agree, they're usually given an opportunity to speak to their side of the application um, and, and the court will run a hearing and the EPOP um, uh, lawyers assist with that hearing. Uh, there could be EPOP lawyers assisting with the hearing or if there's a conflict or, or a time conflict, uh, that, 
that legal services could be sent to the roster. So the list of lawyers that are available to assist with that hearing if it goes outside, so to speak, of the EPOP. Um, the, uh, oh, here it is in the next bullet of that slide that it's a team of staff or roster lawyers to assist to run the hearings. Uh, a claimant would have assistance from legal aid if they qualify. So all claimants have the assistance of the EPOP uh, for the application and for the review. Now, if it goes to a hearing, then a claimant must uh, satisfy the eligibility criteria of legal aid and they can call legal aid to, to see if they do qualify. Uh, and of course, a big aspect of the services of EPOP is to provide uh, education, information, and referrals. Now, some tips uh, or tricks of the trade, so to speak, some tips for successful applications. So first of all, um, uh, the lawyers and the um, support workers through the EPOP, the, the protection order program, know that this is a very difficult process to go through. Um, it's It can feel overwhelming just from the experiences, and then it can feel overwhelming and even triggering to undergo a court process to address it. Um, so hopefully these tips will um, uh, assist uh, both support workers who are assisting a claimant and the claimant themselves that might be making the application. So again, it can trigger past trauma. Uh, the claimant will be asking, to, uh, you know, to directly speak and share um, uh, through a recorded and transcribed application their personal experiences of violence. So it's really important to have um, available additional supports um, either through the process or after the process or both because it can be triggering for that past um, um, memories of family violence or experiences. The process itself can feel overwhelming. Um, the claimant can feel embarrassed or sad. Um, uh, and so it's just essential that the, the person knows that there are supports available and to have those available. So common questions that um, the claimant may be asked through the process, either through the uh, protection order um, counsel who's assisting in the process or from the court, the justice or the judge, uh, him or herself, is first of all, how are you related to the respondent? So um, uh, again, it's coming back to that definition of family violence and, and or, I'm sorry, who is a family member and just being able to relate when you were in a relationship together, when you lived together, what was the nature of the relationship if it was an intimate partner relationship? Probably the claimant will be asked directly or should expect to cite historical examples of family violence. So again, um, while there may be a very specific incident that led to the protection order, um, the court will also ask about history. What is the history um, of the um, family violence, what is the general nature of the relationship, so to speak? Has this been ongoing for an extended period of time or has it been sort of a one-time occurrence? Uh, they, the claimant will be asked to cite specific examples um, of recent family violence. Uh, so it really helps the court to know um, things like a specific date, uh, a specific example of what the family violence was, or if a date isn't readily available, then uh, a chronology um, of events. So sometimes, um, you know, just the nature of the difficulty of the application, it's hard to get those um, specific details out for the claimant, but it's a much stronger, stronger application before the court if the court hears um, on Saturday at 2 p.m., um, I was uh, physically assaulted by the respondent. You know, it's it it points to a very specific example, as opposed to saying um, the respondent has always been very difficult in a relationship. It, uh, that doesn't pinpoint a specific incidents um, that the court can rely on for the protection order. 
And just going on to more questions, um, again, this is the emergency aspect of the of the order. What's the risk if the protection order is not granted? Um, so um, uh, the, the claimant may say something like, I fear that he would assault me again. I fear that she would steal my uh, property again and, and damage it. Um, uh, that there would be some explanation as to why the person believes that they would be at risk if the protection order is not granted. Another common question that we see is, did you report the incident to the police? Were charges laid? Um, and often we see that, while yes, I did report, uh, they're still in the process of investigating. And so, no, I don't know if charges were laid. Charges reporting to the police and charges being laid is not a criteria for granting a protection order. It's It should not be prejudicial if the claimant did not re report. But again, this is a common question that the court does ask. And so sometimes it helps to have that information uh, available if there was a report made. Yes, on Saturday, uh, I did make make a report to the police and I've got a copy of the police report. That's an example of information uh, that might be available. Another common question, and again, this is not determinative of whether an EPO is granted, but has there been previous protection orders? So if there have been previous protection orders, sometimes it helps to have a general idea of when that protection order was granted or when it expired or how many in the past, just have some information on, on uh, whether there were previous orders. Another common question, does the respondent has mental health concerns such as addictions? Uh, th that again is a very common question, not necessarily determinative, but a common question uh, because it is a common um, occurrence for respondents to have enacted the family violence in the first place. Often addictions uh, or other mental health concerns are, are one of the um, reasons that there is family violence. And again, another common question, does the respondent have a criminal record? Um, not determinative, but but that information is sometimes asked of the claimant or the claimant does sometimes share that information. So for those of us that are supporting people who experience family violence, some things that can um, assist or some supports that have been uh, communicated as being very useful through process is to check on people regularly. Often there's a roller coaster of emotions or again uh, there can be triggering events. Um, so sometimes um, while at one period of time uh, a claimant may be expressing a lot of strength and, and be very articulate about their process in another time there just might be uh, a very difficult moment or a moment that feels that it's hard to come out of, so to speak, and so to have those supports available and, and recognizing that there is sometimes some tra tra transition of emotions or um, ability to cope with the process. Uh, it's important to believe what the claimant says. Um, sometimes there is a sense that um, society as a whole or individuals specifically don't believe the stories, um, uh, don't believe the experiences and don't trust um, what's shared. So it's important to um, express that that those um, those experiences are certainly believed and, and taken very seriously. Related to doing homework, so to speak, being informed, a big one um, is to, for our team especially, is to provide referrals so that um, um, once the claimant has sort of uh, progressed through the stages out of the protection order supports, that there are long-term and sustainable supports that uh, they can access immediately and um, and be part of and, and have that sustained, have that support as part of sort of a permanent network, so to speak. Um, even if the claimant doesn't access it um, um, immediately um, on a regular basis, just being able to um, know where to go, so to speak. Who do I call? Should I feel like I need some supports in the in the um, in the future? 
and helping to articulate a safety plan is really important. What do you do, A, to prevent conflict, family violence from occurring? And when you're in the experience of family violence, what can you do to safely get out? Um, this is an important one for everybody to um, to articulate. But I should also mention um, uh, what hasn't been said uh, so far in the slides that sometimes we see uh, claimants on the review. So again, this is the process after an order has been granted, there is a review in court. And sometimes we see claimants that say, no, I don't want to continue the protection order anymore. Um, sometimes there can be dubious reasons for those protection orders to be um, asked to be reviewed Evoked. Maybe there's feeling some pressure from either, either the respondent or the family members of the respondent to revoke that. And so quite often we see the court wanting to be satisfied that the claimant has clearly articulated a safety plan to either prevent or to escape from family violence. Uh, from occurring. So that's an important conversation in some instances where uh, the claimant is asking for the protection order to be revoked, to be removed. Uh, in other cases, sometimes there has just been an escalation of family violence. Uh, uh, the claimant um, is satisfied themselves that there's either a process of uh, reconciliation or mediation or counseling that they feel satisfied will um, um, will assist both the claimant and the respondent in repairing or to avoiding family violence in the future. Um, and, that, and that's another reason why a protection order can be uh, revoked by the claimant. Uh, but again, a safety plan is a very important tool for a person who has experienced family violence. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we round uh, round sort of the final corner of the presentation, where to find supports uh, th through legal clinics. So the phone numbers that was provided previous, um, social support agencies. It's really important for me personally, our program as a whole, and probably for each other to be able to uh, have those relationships with support providers in the community to know um, where, uh, where claimants can go for information, support, um, here's just some of them, and I hope that uh, we can share that uh, a really robust um, a list of supports following the presentation. And, and please do keep in touch with our office for any of you out there who uh, do offer supports and can offer maybe some information uh, for for us to pass on to claimants. So some of the examples, the Edmonton Violence Prevention Center, the Family Prevention, uh, Violence Prevention Team, uh, Community Initiatives Against Family Violence. I know there's many others um, that we that are available um, throughout the province. And of course, the shelters can provide uh, information and, and supports as well. So as we come to the finish line, uh, thanks very much for, for all of you for attending. Again, happy to uh, make connections either through this forum or after um, and would welcome any questions from the floor, so to speak. Yeah, Krista, we've been getting some questions through, so bear with me. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that way the focus is on you here. All right, and again, for questions, you can type them into chat, although Teams does have a question uh, kind of feature that you can click on as well, and then that way we can more formally log the questions. So I'm just going to start in the order the questions were received. Uh, so the first question we had was, how long does someone need to be confined to make an EPO applicable? And I'm sure there might not be a, you know, necessarily an exact time you could provide, but maybe just some information around the confined um, kind of definition of family violence. Yeah. Um... So there, there isn't. Uh, it isn't articulated that there is a specific period of time, um, but. I think the court, in order to make the order, uh, the claimant should share that there was uh, just a reasonable belief that even if they're wrong, they reasonably came to the um, the fear that they uh, couldn't leave that there was some coercion that they couldn't get out of the the situation so it sounds to me like there's maybe a specific example in mind but um again it just um 
um, it really depends on the circumstances of of what the application might be made. Again, this is where it might be important to articulate the history. This hasn't hasn't happened only once. Uh, perhaps the confinement was just you know during the incident that the claimant has in mind for the particular application. Perhaps there had been a history of that. Uh, confinement in the past, and so uh, the the claimant reasonably believed that their freedom, so to speak, was restricted. Uh, so just being able to outline um, the the context or what was the situation behind uh, the particular belief that they were confined. Okay, thanks, Krista. I'm just going to go to the next question here. Uh, and I believe it was answered during the presentation, but just in case if anyone missed it, do you need to meet the income requirements of legal aid to call and get assistance with emergency protection orders? No, everybody, every claimant has the um, uh, assistance of the EPOP uh, program. I, I keep saying EPOP program, it's emergency protection order program. Um, and um, that assistance through the application is through legal aid. However, if there is um, uh, assistance that's uh, required, requested for the review, sometimes that can go to the roster. So it's not always an in-house lawyer, but that person will have that duty counsel support. Um, that's That's been a significant aspect of legal aid's um, um, supports or uh, to the community. It's there's no charge. Where the person must meet income eligibility criteria is if they want supports from a legal aid lawyer or roster lawyer for the hearing. Now, the going through the steps again. There's the application and an order made. Then there's the review. Up until then, there's a guarantee of legal aid services for the claimant. Beyond that, to the hearing, that's when the claimant will um, will meet eligibility criteria in order to have uh, that legal aid certificate issued. If they they do not meet the eligibility criteria, um, they they would uh, canvas counsel. There are lawyers that work primarily or they a large part of their practice is devoted to um, protection order hearings and so they would contact those lawyers. Thanks Krista. Uh, next question we had was can a child apply for an emergency protection order? Usually somebody, a guardian or um, uh, somebody uh, for the child will make that application, but then the application or if there is an order granted, it is on behalf of that child. So yes, children can be protected um, through the emergency protection order. Okay. Uh, we had a question. So if a non-family member, so in this case, uh, who's a neighbor is threatening and harassing me, uh, can I file an EPO or if not, what should I do? Yeah, there are other forms of orders that are available for non-family members. So this would be a, a civil order such as a restraining order or a no contact order. And that process is independent from the emergency protection order. Uh, that information line will provide that information and the referrals for uh, making that application. Okay. Thanks, Krista. Uh, we have the question, is there support for families who live in the Red Deer area from legal aid? Yes, everybody in Alberta has that support through legal aid. So um, um, there are the primary numbers to call. And if that isn't the primary number for that jurisdiction, they'll be directed to their their jurisdiction throughout Alberta. Okay. Uh, we had the question, who's responsible to serve the emergency protection order? Just the comment that it could be dangerous for a claimant to do. Totally. Um, so after a protection order is made, um, it's basically upon pronouncement is when the order comes in effect. So as soon as the court says that the protection order is in place, that's when um, that, that's the moment that it becomes active. So it's critical that the claimant does not serve the respondent. That would be that contact would be a breach of the order, so to speak. And there's practical safety concerns for um, for restricting that access of the service. So usually the service is done through a peace officer, police or RCMP. Um, Okay, thanks, Krista. Uh, we just had a follow up to the previous question. So what other types of orders uh, you mentioned restraining? Are there any other orders that can be obtained for non-family members? 
Yes, and restraining just... orders, no contact orders. Those are two of the, the primary ones that we see. Okay, and then they had a follow up to that. Does legal aid help with restraining or uh, no contact orders? Yes, we do. So if somebody has come through the protection order program um, and if a protection order is deemed not to be the most appropriate order in that case, then we do sometimes work with the uh, respondent on that drafting of the restraining or no contact orders. Okay, and we just make uh, the addition that if you're ever unsure, if potentially it might be an issue that Legal Aid can assist with, you can always contact us at our main contact center number, which is 1-866-845-3425 and speak with one of our intake officers, and then they'll be able to uh, screen if that's potentially an issue that Legal Aid may be able to provide assistance with. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, we have the question, is the legal test for EPOs different for child claimants? Um, I know we talked about child uh, children earlier, but will a judge consider capacity at all? That's the question. Uh, the legal test is the same. Um, uh, capacity, however, if yes, if capacity is an issue for the individual, then capacity will be considered. But that 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 really impacts the process of the application, not necessarily whether family violence has occurred or not. So if there's a capacity issue and there's family violence, uh, then the test is made. If there's a capacity issue for somebody making an application, then there's some questions about whether that person can um, appropriately be their own advocate, in which case they may have a representative, a support person making that application on their behalf. So the capacity test is kind of a world in its own um, in, in the, the, the court proceedings world, so to speak. And it's, it's really um, put simply whether the person can understand and recognize the impacts of the legal decisions that they're making. Thank you, sir. I'm just pulling up the next question here. Uh, sorry, I see we're getting a bunch of questions coming in, which is great. It just takes me a few minutes to make sure we get through. Uh, just while uh, you're looking at the next question, I'm, I'm going to, I had a thought that occurred to me and then my spark went out when we were talking about service. Um, so I was suggesting that we try to restrict the contact between the claimant and the respondent as much as possible. And that um, is the same for the review process. So right now the review process is also um, available to be remote. And, and we encourage that, especially when the claimant and respondent, there may just be some conflict or some triggering uh, for the two people to be together through the court process of the review. Uh, so while we encourage both the claimants and the respondents to attend for the review, we recognize that it's sometimes difficult and there is the ability to attend remotely on the telephone or through WebEx instead of attending in person at the courthouse. That's just a follow-up thought to that question about um, uh, service. Okay, thanks Krista. Uh we have the question, what if a hearing date is set and it's later found that the applicant is not available on that date? Um, and then there's this question, how can you bring forward in court if both parties consent to adjourn? So I think the question is, uh, if a court date's set and then it becomes not available, what would be the best process for someone to look at getting a, a, another date? Uh, there's a couple of ways of doing that, um, and it kind of depends on where it is in the process. Um, so there can be an application to bring the matter back. Um, that's available on the Court of King's Bench website, and I believe it's under um, news and announcements. That's not going to be very helpful, so maybe that can be something that we can follow up with Wyatt to send sure. the link for the process of um, um, reviewing uh, either the order itself, revoking the order after it's made, or um, changes to the order, any terms of the order, uh, there, there's a specific number and link to, to access through the Court of King's Bench website. So look for that in the materials that is sent back to you. So yes, there's a way to get back into the review court, so to speak, to speak to the protection order. So that is either to change any of the terms of the protection order, such as um, the oral hearing uh, order um, and and the the application for an adjournment 
just be prepared to speak to that. Why would you like an application? Are there justifiable and reasonable reasons for that adjournment? If there's consent, if the other party consents, you don't need to necessarily have to make the application. Uh, you, you would just have to speak to that for the record. Now, if there's no time or if time runs out, you can appear for the protection or excuse me, order hearing, um, that process for a hearing is usually there's what's called a triage in the morning in which everybody who's expecting to have a hearing that day attends either in person in court or remotely telephone or WebEx to speak to the um, um, hearing that's that was scheduled to be that day. And that's when that application can be made during the triage on the day that the hearing is um, scheduled for. The triage information is part of the oral hearing order. So at the review phase, uh, if there is an oral hearing that's scheduled, both the claimant and the respondent will receive an oral hearing order that will outline what's needed, the dates or any terms, any filing terms, if there's additional pleadings or paperwork that either the claimant or respondent files, uh, that information will be part of that order as well as information on how to attend for the triage on the day of the hearing. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, we had a question. If there's no history of family violence, is an application more likely to fail? No, I, I, no, I won't say um, uh, one way or the other. Um, so family violence, you know, as long as they're meeting the test of family violence without the history, certainly uh, a first occurrence um, doesn't exclude or preclude an answer that the court may give. Uh, in that instance, it's just a matter of what is the nature of the family violence that occurred and is there that emergency aspect of the application. Thank you. Uh, we had just someone offering their experience. So in my experience, RCMP and victim services have worked together to assist victims in rural communities apply for an EPO. However, attendance of a victim is typically required at the review. Would this be correct more or less? At that's the review, question. yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. So yes, a third party can make that application on behalf of the claimant, um, but the court, not always, and certain um, justices differ in their opinions of whether the claimant should appear for the review um, because we have some of the unknowns um, as a sort of default rule, we encourage claimants to attend in person for the review. So again, that's the 10, uh, that's the court process 10 days after the application and the order is made that they would be back into a review court for that review process. Okay. Uh, I think just a slight follow up to that as well. Clients have told me that they have to stand in court near their abuser and have been often too scared to talk about what happened and then did not get an EPO. Um, so they're just kind of the same lines. want to confirm that typically the applicant does have to be in court at the same time as the other party uh, for the at the review. Oh, at the review. OK, yeah. So again, uh, the applications can be made without the respondent being present. Um, and, and that's the vast majority of cases is it's made ex parte. Uh, so just the claimant being present for the application. The review 10 days later, um, there are uh, uh, claimants and respondents who do attend court together, but the protection order program encourages claimants and respondents to appear via WebEx or telephone. Um, with those processes, um, uh, the telephone is on mute. Uh, until there's a specific question. Sometimes the claimant doesn't speak at all because they have that duty counsel from the EPOP program um, to assist them to speak on their behalf. Uh, if it's via WebEx, the camera can be off and they can be on mute, so they don't have to have that visual or, or oral contact with the, um, with the respondent. Um, they can attend in court uh, and there should be uh, some supports, um, although it it can be limited. I mean, there there's not always the security person in court when they attend in person. Um, so there is um, that aspect of of returning for the review. There could be in person contact. Uh, we had a question just looking for your perspective, your opinion on which percentage of EPOs do you think are due to mental health or addictions issues? So I just wonder if you can share any of your experience for. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But um, uh, just anecdotally, we do see a lot of correlation um, between um, 
the respondent having mental health or addictions issues and and the perpetration of family violence uh it's it's not it's not necessary it's not a a criteria uh, for the protection order but it is certainly a contributing factor and we do see that in the majority of the applications thanks uh, we had a question could an epo be granted when this uh, so in this case it was a mother and son are residing under the same roof so is it still applicable if both parties are living together and may not have you know alternative uh, place to go Yes, absolutely, it's applicable. We see that a lot. Um, but when the protection order is granted, um, there's three terms that we usually see in a protection order that restricts the respondent from uh, living in the same home as the claimant. Um, one is the um, usually the house is included as the restricted um, location for the respondent to attend. Uh, there's the um, distance provision. Usually it's something like 100 or 200 uh, meters from the uh, claimant that the respondent can't um, uh, can't contact her. And the third provision that we sometimes see is the exclusive occupation. So the claimant is granted uh, exclusive occupation of the um, of the home um, that they're living in. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes the claimants move out, um, in which case um, that exclusive occupation uh, provision wouldn't be included. But uh, if there's a protection order and there's at least uh, the the distance or the home address that's included in the protection order, the claimant has to be prepared that that respondent needs to remove themselves and the police will remove them uh, from the protection order. There, There is that enforcement um, ability. Of course, any term on the protection order that's there is enforceable. Um, if there's a breach of the protection order, uh, it's, it's criminal. Um, so the police or RCMP will be Assist, assessing whether it reaches that threshold of criminality. But if there's a breach to the order, the police or RCMP uh, will be uh, involved, especially if they're, well, essentially if the order is made and service on the respondent is, is successfully made. Thanks, Krista. And so I know we only have about two more minutes. So we might have time for about one more question, but then we do want to commit to everyone that for all the questions everyone has asked today, we will keep track of. And then when we publish the recording of this a session either later this week or early next week. We'll also have answers to all the questions that we weren't able to get to today. And we want to thank everyone also for taking the time today and to engage with us and ask questions about emergency protection orders. Um, but here I'll get one last question and then we'll do a bit of a wrap up. And again, we commit that any question we haven't answered, we'll make sure it's included when we do a follow up story on our website as well. Uh, so the last question we had is if the respondent is on a community supervision order with no contact in place, is there still any reason to get an emergency protection order? So if there's already a type of no contact order, would that be yeah. taken into consideration? Oh, definitely taken into consideration, but um, uh, it, you know, the, the, sometimes the details of the specific context um, uh, makes a difference. As a general comment, however, <clears throat> I would encourage a protection order in addition to any um, sort of terms of a probation order or resulting no contact order uh, from criminal proceedings, for example. Uh, the reason being, um, uh, first of all, the enforcement, a protection order, is um, police RCMP enforceable. So if there's a breach, it is through that order that the enforcement can be enacted. Uh, second of all, some of those other terms can be removed without the claimant knowing. Um, so sometimes they're either late in knowing or they are not informed, such as if charges are dropped or if there's another procedure through the criminal proceedings. Um, and, and if that regardless of whether the claimant knows or not, if there's no protection um, other than a protection order, there just simply isn't that that restriction. So yes, we do encourage uh, also having a protection order in addition to any other no contact provisions that might be available, such as through a, a criminal proceeding. Thanks, Krista. And so I know it's one o'clock here. I know we have questions still coming in. Uh, so again, we'll commit that if there's a question that we also you didn't get a chance to enter today so that you thought of after, you can send us an email at communications at legalaid.ab.ca and I'll put that in the meeting chat. Again, we did want to um, 
mention that we can't provide any specific legal advice. This is more just for general information about the emergency protection order and the emergency protection order program. I am just dropping a link into the chat with a quick survey. It is anonymous and we would just love some feedback about today's session just so we can help plan for future sessions. You know, are there topics you're interested in? Um, is one hour enough? Do we need more time? We certainly have had a lot of questions. So, you know, that's all the input that we'd love to get from everyone. So if you could just take a few moments to go through and complete the survey that I've just linked in chat. And then just as a follow up bit of housekeeping, so later today you'll get an email from Legal Aid that will also contain a link to the survey as well as some resources and other referrals that you might be able to find useful for someone facing family violence. It may take us a few days to kind of get the recording set up and then to get answers to all the questions, but as soon as we have that on our website, we'll also send all attendees a follow up email just letting you know that the story is live and give you a link so you're able to access that and find the answers to your questions. And then with that, I just want to say thanks, Krista, for taking the time today to share her knowledge and information about the EPO team. And then thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, we hope everyone has a fantastic day and enjoy the you know, rest of your Wednesday. Thanks everyone. Thanks for attending.